Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in Her Office. Today I'm going to define for you the language of the Aristotelian syllogistic. So this is the first of the three components that go into a particular logic. Now you remember in, our, in the previous video, I made a distinction between the kind of aromatic terms, things like nouns, adjectives, verbs, participles, etc., and the syncategoromatic or non-categoromatic terms, which are basically everything else that go into a sentence. For the purposes of the syllogistic, it really is the categoromatic ones that we are interested in. So from now on, if I say term, I just mean categoromatic term, but it gets long to say that every single time. So with that in mind, let me bring up the whiteboard. There we are. And I can give you the basic definition. So we have a definition. This is the general definition of what a term language looks like. And then in particular instances, we will define specific term languages. But a term language, and we will represent it with a slightly curly L with a subscript T, consists in two things. The first is a set of, again, categoromatic terms, which we will use capital letters from the Roman alphabet to represent. So P, Q, R, S, X, Y, Z. These are the general letters that I will use when I'm kind of talking about an arbitrary term language. If I'm talking about a specific one where I want to kind of have obvious connections between the choice of letter and the English language term that's being represented, I'll generally pick mnemonic ones. But for purposes of illustration, P's, Q's, R's, S's, X, Y, Z's, this set can either be finite in the sense that it is limited or bounded or infinite. For instance, if you want to have one categoromatic term for every single number that exists, that would be fine. And then the second thing that we have are four binary connectives. So a binary connective is something that takes two objects, that's where the binary comes in, and connects them together. So in this case, what it's going to be connecting are categoromatic terms. But the binary connectives that we have are A, E, I, and O, all in the lowercase. And you'll remember these from the previous video, that these correspond to the different type of categorical propositions that we can make. So the copulae that join two categoromatic terms together. So I spoke in the last video, I think, about the difference between logical and non-logical vocabulary. Here, this is the logical vocabulary. The binary connectives are going to stay fixed no matter what, what incarnation or what particular term language that you have. The non-logical vocabulary is the stuff that's going to change from language to language, and that's the set of categoromatic terms that you are interested in. So one term language might talk about cats, dogs, mammals, etc. Another categoromatic language might talk about uh, running, sleeping, eating, reading, etc. This is the vocabulary that we have. So you can think about it as like the individual words. The next definition that we have tells us how we can put this vocabulary together into grammatically correct sentences. Or we have a particular, uh, a particular phrase that we use in logic, and that is the notion of a well-formed formula. So well-formed formula, or this will often be abbreviated WFF, and pronounced with. So if I talk about whiffs, I'm talking about grammatically correct sentences in the language of the Aristotelian syllogistic. So this, is, this definition essentially gives you a method for checking whether you have something that is a well-formed formula. On the first hand, we have that if x and y are two distinct terms, so they can't be the same term. And again, as I said, when I'm talking about terms, it's always with the assumption that these are categorimatic terms. 
So if x and y are two distinct terms, then you connect them with the a, you connect them with the e, you connect them with the i, connect them with the o. All of these are all waves. And that's it. Nothing else is a well-formed, grammatically correct sentence in the language of propositional law, uh, of term logic, sorry, the logistic. This differs from propositional logic, as we will see in a later video, where we will have a notion of a recursive definition, whereby you say what the kind of initially well-formed formulas are, and then give construction rules that make things of ever greater complexity. One of the reasons why the syllogistic is a nice starting logic is because you just have these four types of propositions and that's it. And you can't make anything more complex. It's not unbounded. If you have a finite number of categorimatic terms, there are a finite number of well-formed formulae that you can, uh, you can construct out of them. Now, just to briefly remember that the way we've set this up, x here is what would correspond to the predicate of an English language sentence and y to the subject. So x belongs to all y and so on. So this is the language that we have and the rules for constructing grammatically correct sentences. So clear all of this because now I want to be able to say something about the categorical propositions. So any proposition formed in this way, so according to the definition that I've just erased, is a categorical proposition. Now, categorical propositions have various properties. We will we will say explicitly what these properties mean, but first I will just give you a brute, uh, brute force definition that you can take on faith. So there are definition. There are two qualities that a categorical proposition might have. They are affirmative and negative. There are also two quantities that a categorical proposition can have. They are universal and partial. Each of the four types of categorical propositions can actually be uniquely identified by their quality and their quantity. So let us do diagrams. Logicians love diagrams. So here we can have quality. They are either affirmative or negative. And then we also have quantity, either universal or partial. Now, an A claim, X belongs to every Y, is universal because it's talking about everything and it's affirmative. It's saying that something does hold. On the other hand, the E claim, X belongs to no Y, is universe, uh, universal and negative. So it's saying something about all of the Ys and it's saying that something does not hold of them. Then we have the I claims are affirmative and partial because they're saying something positive. X belongs to some Y, but they're only saying it about part of the Ys, not all of them. And then we have the partial negative and that is the O claim. So X does not belong to some Y. Now, there is an interesting little mnemonic that, you can, that I can give you that will help you, un help you remember which of the vowels goes with which of the types of claims. So, just a sec, here we go. If you look at the word affirmative, look at that. 
its first two vowels are A and I. If you look, well, it doesn't work with negative because this is English. If you look at the Latin root, the words are affirmo, or I affirm, and nego for I deny. And then, look at that, we have an E and we have an O. There are going to be so many little mnemonics for the Aristotelian syllogism that go back to medieval Latin. Whoever would have thought that you would learn this much Latin in a logic course? Any case, we've got the qualities and the quantities. We can identify sentences as either affirmative or negative, universal or partial. And this is the spread of what you can say in our syllogistic language. Now, uh, not every sentence in English can be fitted into a categorical proposition. So one thing that you will notice if you start kind of looking for categorical propositions in the wild, you'll find them, but you won't find many of them. This is the first indication that we have that there is a limitation on what this language can express. We'll come back to this topic in future videos and it will uh, form part of our motivation for looking at different systems of logic. But for now, this is actually a good thing because it gives us a limited, limited material that we can try to get our hands on. We'll pause here because that gives us kind of the building blocks that we need. The next thing that we need to be able to do now that we have our language and our rules for constructing sentences is I'll have to give you rules for constructing arguments. So that will be the topic of the next video. Let's stop sharing that whiteboard and then it just remains to say see you next time. Cheers! <laughs>